We have dozens of disease-modifying therapies for MS, but remember what former world chess champion Emmanuel Lasker said, when you see a good move, look for a better one. Indeed, we should always look for new and better treatments for MS. And in this extraordinary publication from Sweden, the authors discovered 18 potential new MS drugs. These are repurposed existing drugs that could potentially treat MS. Let's see how they did it, the methodology they used, and these 18 drugs and how promising they really are. So you can better understand the article. Let's review the central dogma of cell biology. DNA is the genetic material of the cell, it's a double-stranded helix, and is then transcribed into messenger RNA, and this messenger RNA is then translated into proteins. These are the building blocks and enzymes and other structures in the cell which carry out the functions of the cell and are the targets of various drugs. I give credit to first author Yuan Zhang, who is actually a PhD candidate in Sweden. This article is quite an achievement for someone still in training. What she did is took data from 14,000 people with MS and compared it to around 27,000 non-MS controls. Now these were people of European ancestry. The reason they restricted it to Europeans is because there are some variations in the rate of polymorphisms or variants of DNA in different ethnicities, so it helps to just focus on one ethnicity. Of course, this could reduce the applicability to other ethnicities though a lot of evidence suggests that medications that are effective in Europeans are also likely to be effective in non-Europeans with MS. They had a total of about 37,000 transcripts of messenger RNA from the blood, and they found a total of over 7 million variations of single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are gene variants where there's a change in one letter or one nucleotide of the DNA. So you can imagine your entire genome is like a book. Each letter are these individual nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymidine, and there's a change in just one letter and that can change the actual protein that is produced. They also had samples of brain cortex from 2,400 or so autopsies. So special credit to people who donated their brain to science to help with this research. And they found over 11 million single nucleotide polymorphisms from these brain samples. So if you compare these gene variants in people with MS and without MS, you can see some different potential protein targets. They tried to focus their analysis on genes not already known to be linked to multiple sclerosis. Now the problem with looking at a lot of genes is if you have a p-value of 0.05 and you look at 10,000 genes, just by random chance, some of the genes will appear to be linked to MS. And so you actually have to correct for doing multiple analyses. This is called a Bonferroni correction. And hence the corrected p-value in blood samples was 6 6.6 times 10 to the negative 5, and in the brain samples, it was 2.8 times 10 to the negative 5. So these are very small numbers, but you have to do this to correct for the fact that you're analyzing so many genes and messenger RNA strands and proteins. There are also some other technicalities. For instance, there are linked genes. You could have a gene that causes or increases the risk of MS, and another gene that's close to it on the chromosome, and it will appear to be associated associated with MS, even though it has nothing to do with MS. They did some fancy math to try to correct for this. You'll just have to trust the authors on this one. And they found proteins that are potentially causally linked to MS. Of course, it's not definitive. There could be other confounders, but it's a good starting point. And then they searched through databases of drugs which target these proteins, and they identified drugs which could potentially benefit people with MS. And they found 21 plasma asthma or blood proteins that were linked to MS risk and 212 brain proteins linked to MS risk and they also analyzed messenger RNA levels. These are the proteins in the plasma associated with MS and anything above this dotted line was statistically significant. The one with the strongest link was ATF6B. This is a protein that's expressed in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. This is an organelle 
or a tiny organ in the cell that's involved in synthesis of lipids and steroids and trafficking and modification of proteins. And when there's stress on the cell, it's known that this protein cleaves off and is released and then acts as a transcription factor. In other words, it changes the transcription of other parts of the DNA. So it's thought to be involved in response of the cell to stressful events. It's known that mutations in this protein can cause a very rare disease called Wolfram syndrome 1, which is a neurodegenerative disorder that can cause vision loss, optic atrophy or shrinkage of the optic nerve, diabetes insipidus, and deafness. These are the proteins in the brain most associated with MS risk, and it may be hard to see on your screen, but some of them are very famous, well-known proteins, such as MTHFR, this is an enzyme involved in vitamin B12 and folate metabolism. Deficiencies can lead to elevated levels of homocysteine and have been associated with heart attacks and strokes. Also, GALC-C deficiency leads to a rare genetic disease called Crabbe's disease. But the number one linked protein was HLA-B, or human leukocyte antigen B, this is a protein involved in immune function. It's part of the major histocompatibility complex class 1, and it's part of how your immune system binds antigen and presents them to CD8 positive or killer T cells. So it's involved in inflammation, and we do in fact see CD8 positive T cells in the brain and spinal cord in lesions of people who have multiple sclerosis. And it's well known that HLA-B polymorphisms or gene variants are linked to various autoimmune diseases. Interestingly, in MS, it's thought that the major histocompatibility complex class 2 may be more important, and the gene most associated with MS actually has to do with MHC class 2 HLA DRB1 1501. So this may be reverse causation. Maybe people with MS have more brain inflammation and that that leads to more MHC1 expression, so we're picking more of that protein up. Perhaps, I'm not sure, but it's very neat that a gene and protein related to the immune system ended up number one on this list. Now, the study picked up proteins that are known targets of existing MS drugs. Now, maybe we don't care about this, we're looking for new drugs, but it shows us we're on the right track. So targets of CD20, the B cell depleters, Briumbi, Cassimpta, Ocrevus, along with Copac, Axone, Glatopa, Lemtrada, Tysabri, Mavenclad, beta interferons, all of these showed up in this study, so it looks like we're on to something. They also found proteins which are new drug targets, not really previously thought to be part of the pathogenesis of MS. For instance, CD59, this is a complement inhibitor. Complement are proteins in the blood which normally function to poke small holes in pathogenic bacteria like Neisseria meningitidis. Complement were really not thought to be important in the pathogenesis of MS. Also, FAM120B, which is involved in the function of peroxisomes. These are small organelles involved in breaking down fatty acids and dangerous oxides like hydrogen peroxide. So even though many of these proteins don't have existing drugs which target them, it does open up the avenue of future research. But now we move to the main event of the evening. These on the left are the 18 potential new MS drugs. So on the right, we see known MS drug targets and the MS drugs which are already on the market with the exception of Declizumab, which was never approved due to the risk of liver failure, and the potential new drug targets and the drugs which already exist and are used for other conditions which target them. Let's take a look at these new targets and the drugs that could be used. We'll start with IDUA. This is the gene that makes the enzyme alpha l idurinidase which is involved in the breakdown of glycosaminoglycans, which are part of the extracellular matrix. If you're genetically deficient in this enzyme, it can cause a serious disease called Hurler syndrome, also known as mucopolysaccharidosis type 1, and there's actually a treatment in enzyme replacement therapy called Luronidase. It's unclear to me how this could potentially potentially benefit people with MS, but it's an interesting finding. The next is a familiar name, TNFRSF1A, the gene for tumor necrosis factor 1. This is a cytokine, and historically people thought multiple sclerosis is just like rheumatoid arthritis of the brain. So drugs which block TNF-alpha, like Humira and 
Embryo, they should also treat MS, but it turns out it doesn't work. Those drugs actually make MS worse or could even cause MS when they're used to treat other conditions. So it would make sense that giving tumor necrosis factor alpha could actually benefit people with MS. And there are two such drugs. This one I won't even try to pronounce. And the other is tasinermin, which is actually used to treat certain types of soft tissue tumors. However, this is a very pro-inflammatory molecule with a lot of side effects. I don't know that it's a practical treatment of MS, even if it could be effective. Next is WARS, the gene for tryptophanol transfer RNA synthetase. What this does, it is attaches tryptophan, just the amino acid tryptophan, to transfer RNA. Interestingly, this gene is induced by interferons, which are drugs to treat multiple sclerosis, so there is some connection. I was able to find one study suggesting people with MS do have lower levels of tryptophan in the blood on average. Tryptophan, of course, is incredibly safe and inexpensive. It's just that amino acid in Turkey that's thought to make you sleepy. These are just derivatives of tryptophan. I think this is worthy of further research. And this is not a popular supplement in people with MS, but maybe it's worthy of some consideration. Here is TYMP thymidine phosphorylase. And there are a lot of drugs here. A few of them are cancer drugs. Zalota, which is converted to 5-fluorouracil and 5-fluorouracil itself. And these are already in use to treat cancer. And maybe they would work for multiple sclerosis. But we already have the drug teraflunamide or Abagio, which also works on the pyrimidine synthesis pathway and is probably safer with less side effects. So unless these were more effective, it's hard to imagine they would replace existing drugs. Same thing with fluxuridine. This is a pyrimidine analog also used to treat cancer. I would say the same story, unless it's better and more well tolerated than Abagio, probably not worthy of much further research. More interesting perhaps are the antiviral agents like Viroptic, which is used to treat herpes simplex virus infections of the eyes, or Sidofavir, which treats cytomegalovirus infections of the retina. And this drug also has some evidence of activity against Epstein-Barr virus, the cause of mononucleosis in animal studies. And of course, EBV is well known to be associated with risk of MS. Some other drugs, the experimental drug KW2331, a ribonucleotide reductase inhibitor, in research as a potential cancer treatment, and tipiracil, which is a cancer treatment, one of the ingredients in Lonser. Finally, there's MTHFR, or methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, which is this enzyme in this biochemical pathway. And it's thought that you can overwhelm deficiencies in the enzyme with the supplements B12 and folate and that may prevent the accumulation of toxins such as homocysteine. Of course, these vitamins are extremely safe to take at reasonable doses, though I would say there's actually less evidence that they're beneficial in MS compared to things such as vitamin D or omega-3 supplements like fish oil or flaxseed oil. But of course, it's reasonable to take these just in case. So to summarize, Jang and her colleagues looked at the DNA, messenger RNA, and proteins in people with and without MS, and they found some certain disproportionate rates of proteins in people with MS that could be potential drug targets, and they found 18 potential new MS treatments. Three of them are vitamin supplements, which are very safe, tryptophan, vitamin B12, and folate, and various prescription medications, some of which may cause too many side effects or be too similar to existing agents to grant serious consideration, but there are certainly some potential drugs which could warrant further research. I'd be interested to know which of these agents are you potentially most excited about and do you have suggestions for future videos?